All right, so um, Rado Kirov from Singapore, but also from uh, Bulgaria, and also Bulgaria, from... I in Singapore. I graduated at the University of Illinois. Urbana Champagne. Cool, and from Urbana Champagne, who's your number theorist, right? Yeah, number theory, coding theory. But also a web application developer. So he's going to talk about the um, Sage Notebook today. All right, so this is talk about the Sage Notebook, so it's done in the Sage Notebook. All right, so first of all, uh, I'm not going to use the whole 15 minutes, so if you have any questions or comments, feel free to interrupt me. Can you make it bigger? Is this big enough? Full screen? Full screen? Oh. How's that? Good. All right. All right, so everybody has this seen the notebook, at least heard about it. Uh, I know some people prefer not to use it, but it's there. So what is the same notebook? Uh, so it's a full-blown web app supporting multiple users, document editing, collaboration, all this administration stuff. And I like to think of it, you know, this is, it's, it's basically like something like Google Docs already there. And on top of it, it, it can execute Sage code. So it's a non-trivial piece of software. It has to do all that and on top of it, execute Sage. All right, so originally it was developed by uh, William Stein, Alex Klemesh, Klemesh and Tom Goodby around 2006. And here's a little quote from William, why it was the, why is the web app chosen to be the, 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 the GUI for Sage. This is, the, this is the, the main GUI for Sage, and uh, basically his, his, his uh, William's choices were made because uh, writing GUIs is hard, and it's very system dependent, whereas when you write a web app, it's independent whether you're a Mac user, a Linux user, a Windows user, it's the, you pass on the problem to the people who build the browsers, so therefore it, it behaves pretty much the same on all those uh, Systems. All right, so that was 2006, where web apps were still a little bit, you know, they were not as, uh, as uh, mainstream as Maybe they are right now. In retrospect, I could add to that that um, one of the other reasons, which I hadn't realized at the time so much, was that Alex Clemishon, um had just worked for a year in the physics department at UC San Diego, uh, setting up Web Mathematica pages, whatever Web Mathematica is or was. And so he was he had been doing a lot of stuff with putting math on web pages for the physics department. And so when he went to work for me on Sage, he was um, interested in having something similar that's web based. So that was uh, so that I mean was, I hadn't really thought about that. But a year later he told me this. What when was JS Math introduced? Uh, I don't know, maybe two thousand I think it was later. Yeah, I think we at the for a while we just used um, DVI PNG, and yeah, and had like LaTeX blocks that appeared. Yeah, it was pretty ugly. JS yeah, Math made a huge, improvement. yeah, huge, huge improvement. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so this quote is from William's blog. All right. So the terminology, I guess, if you haven't seen that, uh, no, the the notebook is the actual server or. The web app is the notebook, and the worksheet is the actual document that you're working on. The cell is a executable thing. So, uh, if you're coming from the mathematical world, the mathematical notebook is the worksheet. So, what they call notebooks. All right. So, why is the notebook good? Why why should we be using it? Or what 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 does it give you that you don't get in the in the command line. <coughs> well, it comes with, since it's a web app, it comes with all this uh, great HTML, you know, HTML5 uh, modern web tools, which are integrated in the web app. So it gives you, it, it, it gives the developers easy way to integrate lots of things which are already out there, and now you can go on and use them. So for, first thing is the tiny MC, so I guess probably you've already seen it, but this text, if you want, Click on it. This is a tiny MC. Is this uh, 
this, I guess, widget. I, I don't know how to call this thing, so I, I use widget. I know it's not a friendly word anymore. But this widget, which, uh, which lets you edit. And uh, so you can, you can you have your uh, text editor right there. So you can add a text in between your computation. When you're done, shift and then. It's, now it's a, now it's a HTML. All right, so that's TinyMC. jQuery UI, that's a, a set of uh, user interface tools, which is already, it's also part of Sage, it's uh, bundled with Sage. So that's what's used for uh, the interacts. So the, I'll show the interacts later. Uh, it, whenever you see a slider or any UI element that's done through jQuery UI. And again, it was already done, nobody had to go and rewrite it. So again, the notebook really helps. It fits into the Sage philosophy of don't reinvent the wheel. The inputs out there. JMO is what's used for uh, displaying 3D, 3D graphs. So JMO, most as a molecule, it's done for, for uh, molecular biology, but it's, it's a Java applet, so it's the old spec, but it's a Java applet that can display 3D. So every time you plot 3D in the notebook, it goes on and goes JMO. And JSMAT is what makes this nice display of layback in the, so this, this is not, right, this is not an image, this is a, it's a JavaScript, right? So here, here's it. It looks like it's a LaTeX that I can edit, and it's a JavaScript, uh, JavaScript program that takes this LaTeX and makes it look like a real LaTeX on the fly. And you can also cut and paste it. Right? Yeah, you can, I mean, right now it's text. Well, yeah, but even from the display. Right. You, no. You, well, you if you like? click on it. No. Sort of. Yeah. That there's this thing. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, yeah, but, but just because it, it's JavaScript. So, it, it take this. So, I mean, those were all tools that were out there. I mean, somebody had to go through the trouble integrating them, but it was still not as bad as rewriting. All right. And then what Sage, what Sage added is interacts. So, things added in Sage. So, this is a. This is an example of an interact. What is this? this is uh, doing a live compression of an image using single value decomposition. Uh, so the interact is, as it's interactive, there's this slider here. It increases and it redoes the, the compression. So, so again, the sliders, that's jQuery UI, all the button, the, you know, the check marks, all, all the UI elements were, they're already done and you just, we just had to, uh, Sage developers had to put them together and uh, tie it up to the Sage core and make, reevaluate when you change. So this is an example. There's many more interacts. So if you go to the wiki, SageMath interacts, I think, maybe for no while, but there's, it's a big library of all sorts of interacts. So if you're teaching calculus or linear algebra, there's many, many more. So make sure to check that. Uh, right, so another thing is the graph data. This is what I'm responsible for, so I have to show it. This is how I got into this code. I think there was, there was a post on the Sage Develop board uh, and somebody was saying it would be nice if you can edit graphs on the fly. And uh, I've been playing around with, H, with JavaScript and HTML and I knew I could do this using the canvas element. So okay, now you can make the graph. This is what's currently in Sage. Right, so you, you make your graph and uh, it 
He has this physical model. <coughs> so this, again, this is using modern browser technology. It's campus tag, JavaScript, and uh, what I made it do is you give the variable name and you click save. It spits out the data that Sage understands, sends it back to Sage. So now, now we have this graph in Sage that you can do serious math on it. You can uh, ask for eigenvalues and do non trivial computations. Um, so maybe, maybe it's a good, just to do a little plug. I have a new version of the graph editor which is not in Sage right now, but it will be soon. So just to show you, and again, these are things that probably will never be in the command line version of Sage. So <laughs> you have to use the notebook if you want to see those things. So this is how the new graph editor is going to, going to look. And again, now I have uh, the menu comes out, in and out. Very, again, this is uh, those sliding effects are done in jQuery. Um, jQuery is used by everybody who does any JavaScript. So it's a very well maintained library. So it's very easy to write interactive things in JavaScript and uh, HTML. So, <coughs> so the new features in the graph editor now, you can select edges and vertices. You can split an edge. Uh, so the live feature is much faster, now much smoother. Why is it so much faster? Uh, the old one actually just had that setting. It, it didn't have, the, so <laughs> you can see. All the vertices bounce off and students. Yeah, right. So, so this is modeled uh, in physical model. The edges are springs. The, all the vertices repel each other. It's live particle system. Uh, and JavaScript, in, this is in Chrome. Chrome JavaScript is really mm -hmm. fast right now. Uh, everyone knows it. And all the other browsers are claiming they'll catch up to Chrome in their next release. Firefox says they, will, they have even, are we fast enough yet, web page? So Firefox claimed they'll be just as fast as Chrome. So there's a big. There's lots of money thrown to making JavaScript fast, and uh, so maybe actually even better. You waste a lot of time playing with the editor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so here's a, a grid graph, uh, except in a circular layout. So turn on live, the, the, le <laughs> the, the, the spring lengths are too long. So you have to decrease the spring lengths. That is awesome. And all of a sudden you get to see the actual. <laughs> <laughs> So, and, you know, it's non-trivial computation, I think, to have all these things. It's hundreds, every single one repels to every single other one. So it's all that square. Slightly orientation. Orientation just rotates around. As you can imagine, and the edge, length, and... Click vertex numbers, that's how it is. Okay, there it is. The vertex numbers, and, uh, I added labeling, because uh, the French combinatorial group was very insistent on having labeling. <laughs> uh, now we have labels, so uh, actually they're not going to the numbers. This happened. So I can add any label here, it will remember it, and uh, you can now we can throw it back in Sage and see what's yeah, we can do math with it. So, okay. so could that label be some function of the index? Well, the, the, list of names the thing is, what will happen eventually is you'll be working on this in Sage. Mm -hmm. So, of course, in Sage you can do all that, and then you just click Graph Editor and just throw it back out there. And then you wouldn't, I mean, now we're in JavaScript, so I don't want to add a little computation. Yeah. But I want to make the, the link very... It's not hard because of things like JSON, which is uh, this protocol which, uh, you know, you encode your data in Python with one line of Python, you're saying JSONize this object. Get it in JavaScript. You get it as you get the same. Basically, you get a dictionary, get the list, and then you do what you want in JavaScript with it. Uh, right. So, and again, so for example, for help, you know, pretty you know, good, good-looking help uh, in a matter of seconds, just because of jQuery UI. Right. So this is jQuery UI. I don't have to write anything to make a nice-looking window pop up and so on. So. So I think that that's a lot of potential to have widgets like this uh, in the notebook for different mathematical objects. All right, so what else is there in the notebook? 
I don't know if many people know that. I didn't know that this was embarrassing until January. Uh, it's a, it's you know basic code editor. This little you know text area it has attached things to it. It uh, if you click Control Zero it closes the last bracket. So I, I just press Control Zero three times. To close the right bracket. And how many of you knew that? I, I did. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. Uh, is there a list of these somewhere? Yes. It is. It's in help. It's, it's right there. But Every single thing is listed there. Yeah, yeah, but those are written there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you, it's not assuming because you see the text area and you think oh, it's just a text area. But it's, it's not just a text area. It has JavaScript attached to it. So it, it's here somewhere. Yeah. Fair and matching. Fair and matching, yeah. Did you write it? No. No, lots of different people wrote it. Each time they add a feature to the notebook, they add an entry to a table. I might just put it all over. Maybe if we, maybe it's not pretty enough. Yeah, that's probably the problem. Maybe it needs to spin around and jump up and down. Yeah. <laughs> maybe you need to round the corners or something. Perhaps like a little paper clip could pop up in the corner <laughs> saying, it looks yeah. like you're editing a graph. It can be done with JavaScript. Yeah. Okay, so the, the, the two useful things are, Close brackets and comment and comment. So you can also do the. Oops, I'm control. Yeah, okay. <coughs> right, so, so this is the so comment and uncomment, a selection. Uh, just control dot and control comment. Control period, control comment. Okay, so you, you, can, you can actually edit your Python in a semi. You know, it's like a basic code editor. It's not just a yeah, an auto indent. Auto indent, yeah, right? He has a. Like everyone knows, like you get the right, right out in that. So this is right, so it already goes in, and it's supposed to have highlighting, but it was too slow. So maybe uh, maybe browsers are fast enough now. It, again, there are libraries out there to do highlighting, so you, you hook them up and you see you see they're faster. You know. So another thing I like, which I don't, I don't know, it's more, I don't know how useful it is, but uh, it's a self-editable web page. It's a web page which you can edit on the fly with Python. So you can do things like this, where you can attach a, a style, you know, and so you, you, you insert, you, you do some Python computation, but at the end you can insert HTML tag. So then you can do something like this, okay, you, know, you get a little alert. So if you have a big computation and you find a counterexample to the BSD conjecture or something you want to alert, <laughs> say publish. But I don't know, it, it, it's just, it's out there and it, it can be, I mean, I, maybe this is too simple, but maybe you can use it for something useful. Uh, so for example, here, this became a div with certain ID, now I can, Edit it. Wait, so jQuery UI is already there, so this div also that got attached and became a multiple box. So, again, be creative. You can make it's out there. It's just because you work in a browser. Um, right, so, and this is somebody asked for this. They're going to ask, say, uh, ask Sage, you know, the Sage version of Stack Overflow. So you can do a computation, and when it's done, it's, it's a sound. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just inserts audio tag, and <laughs> so you know. Well, that was not a big computation. You have a big that's like a computation. Wow. Maybe you should submit this as a as a patch. Yeah, as a uh, boing bong gong. It will be a function called gong. Gong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so again, just because browsers are moving ahead and they're adding all these features, and uh, the notebook is, by you know, by definition, the notebook already has those features because it's in a browser. So, and it's in a browser, and it's not kind of locked down to be some special wiki language or something. Right. That's the other key thing. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's which it's enables all kinds of evil attacks on it, but yeah. it makes it much more useful. Alright, uh, was somebody was asking for easy matrix inter, uh, matrix editor, so 
it's very easy to, so what I do is I make an iframe, and I go to some web page I have, and uh, so this, this is a matrix editor where if you hit enter, it goes to the next one. And then at the end, the one below gets updated as a Python matrix list, right? So the, the thing you want to, you have to input into Sage. So, you know, if you want some, it's, it's very easy to. What happens if the numbers are really big? Uh, okay, got it. Is there a possibility of integrating with JSMAP instead of having it look like a pretty matrix? Yeah, I mean, this, I did this in like one, uh, five minutes. Because like, somebody put it there, and I, I just I found somebody else, so somebody already had this because somebody had a J, jQuery extension for editing tables because you know, jQuery is used by. So I just put it, I mean, I, I didn't, I haven't talked much about it, but you can do, or it, it, it's just a web page, so then you can, uh, right, you can have JS Matt entries there. Which I don't know what if, but if right now you put JS Matt, no, no problem. Well, I don't know, but I, I'm, sure, I'm sure everything's possible, except it takes work. <laughs> it, it's, you have to smooth on the edges. Uh, that's kind of the, the mantra of the notebook. It's, it's very loosely tied. So. so if your server goes offline, nobody can do uh, matrix editing. No, no, but right, that, this, this is them, right? So the idea is this to be bundled with a Sage notebook. You can actually write. Yes. But like for a little demo, yeah, like you're this, doing live transactions to back to University of Illinois. Well, to load it the first time, then yes. it's loaded already. So right now it's already loaded. So right now you, you, you just, I mean, the, the actual right computation right. is the JavaScript in the browser. So there's no, yeah. Okay, uh, so in the same thread, this is something Alex Leone did. He's here. He's probably at work. Huh? He's probably at work. He's at work, okay. So, serious people at work. Okay, so this is uh, displaying a matrix in a, so I don't, I don't know how much was, how much he added or was already there, but I don't know why this never ended up on stage. He says he stopped developing for it, but Because he wanted to rewrite it to be better. Okay. Oh, I know. Well, uh, <coughs> all right, so I mean, it's, it's almost. Yeah, it's and the color's based on the The color is based, yeah, the, 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 the number gives you the, the color. So this is if you have a huge matrix as it yells. Uh, visualize it. So again, this goes into this idea of you can make widgets uh, for your math objects that take the math data, mm -hmm. you know, represent it a certain way, and hopefully, or maybe edit, maybe not edit, maybe just for viewing, but so things like this, this are possible in the notebook and uh, I think they're, they're useful. Alright, so now I'm gonna this was just showing you what the notebook can do. It was exciting about it. Now I'm going to talk about the actual technology behind it. <coughs> so, okay. so, so the notebook, what, what everybody <coughs> in view has uh, currently is, so as a web app, it's written using Twisted Web 2.0 or Web 2. And the actual data is in memory Python classes, which are stored in the file system. So there's no database. And the web server is Twisted Server. And the problem is, the first problem that we faced in January was that Twisted Web 2 is deprecated. And if you go to their website, and you go to the official Twisted FAQ, FAQ they'll say, what is that? They didn't really want to admit the existence of Twisted Web 2 anymore. Oh, God. So the, yeah. <laughs> They, uh, th this is answer to the question, yeah, should I use, yeah, should I use Twisted Web 2, what is that? So, uh, yeah, it, I guess, it, well, well, right, it was started in 2006, and 2006 Web 2 was upcoming project, and then later people realized it was not the right way to do it. And if you read the code, it, it reads weird. It's, if you used to Ruby on Rails, Django, or all, the, all those things, Web 2 is completely different. <laughs> and. Uh, it, yes, it, it lost the battle, and now it's not even, now it's, what is that? 
so what we, what uh, Mike Hansen and uh, I did in SageH27 in January here is we rewrote the web app part in uh, Flask, which, which we, that's really capitalized. Okay, so it's a uh, so Flask is actually a much more modern framework for doing web apps. It's uh, in Python. It's similar to Django. It's much smaller. It's a micro framework, as they call it, and uh, it's more flexible because of that. And uh, we kept so we kept Twisted as a server, and uh, Flask is a web app. And there's this thing called WSGI, which is an interface to have web apps uh, talk to the server, so Twisted serves Flask through the WSGI uh, interface. <coughs> so, so if you want to see the, so this is not in Sage yet, and uh, if you want to see the current, this my current branch, uh, you can go to Google Code, and uh, so if you go there, you see I have full instructions, so if you want to test this, Right, so can we get bigger? Okay. Sorry to see. Right, so the, there are the instructions how to if if you want to test the, this uh, Flask version of the notebook. So Rob recently went through those, and there were a few <laughs> un unclear things which were clarified. So now everybody should be able to do it. So there's the Linux and uh, Jason added the ones for my class. and. Uh, if you wonder if it's usable, uh, I'm using it for this. So it's, it is usable. The, the, it's, I've already been using it. So. The, only, the, only two thing, the only problems with the current one that's. Okay, so JMO has some issues right now. It doesn't work. Uh, there's something called User Manager, which I added, uh, which uh, Mike added, and then uh, and, uh, I, uh, I tweaked it a little bit, and uh, now it needs to be more. It needs to be tweaked to save the <coughs> settings that it holds, right? So it's, it, it's not serialized. And the other issue is race conditions, because if it gets I, run multi-threaded, then it should I work. haven't, we don't have actual reproducible problem. But you did before. You just we, fixed we, one. We did, and we fixed it, yes. Yeah. That well, well, we, you fixed it in the sense that we don't get error, and we don't, I mean, it works. So. But, but, but there should be we need more, it needs more testing. It's not ready to be sent out, but uh, every error that was identifiable is sent to me. Yes, Rob found a few. He sent it to me, and I think I fixed them. So we need more errors, that are more bugs that are clearly stated. So yeah, there might be some uh, concurrency issues because it's, uh, it's I think it's, it's multi-threaded, whereas the old one was. Yeah. Well. It's an incredibly unthreaded safe application suddenly being run multi-threaded. And if you run it that way, it's going to run into all kinds of interesting, funny business, especially when you test it with more than one user. Right, so if anybody wants to help us test it, then give us a reproducible bug. Careful how we deploy it. All right, and uh, so and another thing needs to be packaged better, I guess, and set of scripts. But those are the... Those are things on my list that things that I want to fix. Again, if anybody else can help us add more. Uh, so just to explain what is uh, happening, probably every, everybody's seen this. This is the quintessential design pattern for modern web apps, model view controller. So it, it's so quintessential. I found this in you know, three seconds, Google, the great. Great uh, picture of MVC. It's, it, it's all over the web, right? So, uh, so I didn't make this. So that's why it's not really. It's not. Well, every every MVC works like that. Except Sage doesn't have this MySQL box on top, right? So Sage, what Sage had had before the controller was Twisted Web two. The view we had the templates already there. So views. So I don't know if everybody's seen this, right? So the control, the browser talks to the controller. Model is where your data is, and the view is what you're going to send out to the user. So you, what the controller takes the model, fills it in the views, 
the templates and sends them back to the browser. So <clears throat> what we changed is the controller part. We didn't touch the models. We didn't touch the views. That's why it was, we managed to do it in one week. <coughs> and uh, so still, I guess the view is in pretty good shape already. The view is in good shape. Templates Various. are out there. Yeah. yeah. So they, they don't need to be touched unless you want to. So the main remaining those. thing that needs to be rewritten is the model. Right. So right. So the model right now, there's no SQL right now. It reads it from straight from the uh, files into memory and serves it from memory. Uh, so everything is in Python objects, and that's that's not. I guess it's a standard way of doing those things, and it's not. I guess not good for scalability. Uh, so what we change the controller. So maybe if you want to see. So if you want to see how it how it looks, so if you pull the new notebook from my repository, so can, can everybody see this? Right. So you see what we did is we added this extra folder Flask version. So everything else was there before. So if you go to Flask version, this is the new controller. So what does the controller do? It, it has those funny decorators app route which take a certain URL and at that, you know, uh, at this URL corresponds to a certain Python function. So this is something that would be easily understandable. So, and this is, if you look at the old code, which used to be something called twisted.py, it looks completely different. But if you've done any web app in uh, Django or any the other more modern web apps, this will be very familiar. You can jump straight into it and start developing. So, uh, right. So, for example, if you if you want to see the history, it calls uh, render template. So it takes a template, <coughs> history.html, and fills fills in the username and uh, the notebook. This is the model, which is the notebook was already back. It was already done. They changed it. It has a function called user history text. So it goes to this Python object called the, the notebook. It gets a user history and renders the template <coughs> with that data and gives it back to the user. So it, it's very straightforward. I, I've heard from a few people that they were trying to read the old Twisted Web 2 code and they couldn't understand what it's doing. And, and they, they read this and it, it makes sense to them. So, but then again, we didn't touch what this notebook object was. So it's still the same as uh, first time, I guess, when it was made last, in the last four years. Uh, so, okay. So that's how the flask looks. And then the, the actual data, if you want to see the data, you go to .sage, sage notebook .sage NB, or whatever you, you told first time you start a notebook, it asks you where to save the notebook data. So this is, you know, this is all the data for the notebook and it's stored as, for example, the users are stored as a pickle. So you, can, you can actually <coughs> open it and see exactly what it is. So this is all the users for the notebook. So all the all the, see, all the notebook data is stored in the, this folder in pickles or file in files. And so these are all the options for the users. Is the user suspended? Is the email confirmed the password? Uh, it's it's test. So don't don't try to run rainbow tables. On it. There's no interesting test. It's it's uh, hashed. Okay. So, so this is the the model for this web app. The model here. All right. So again, this didn't change. This was the same before. This, this is, it was the same as before in the new Flask version. All right. So, a few words about testing. Um, 
So there are two types of testing you want to do on the web app. You want to test the functionality if all the cl you know, user clicks everywhere, it's fine. So for this, we are, there was already a very good test suite uh, using Sel Selenium. So maybe I can show this. So what Selenium does is it's functional testing. So it, you write these little scripts which tell basically drive the browser through JavaScript. So it tells the browser, click here, click there, and they inject it into the browser. So the test runs within the browser, and uh, and the, you know, you check at the end if I click here, click there, do I get the you know you put some assertions and so on. So let's see if I can demo this. So so what you start is a Selenium server with Java. It's written in Java. Then you start the tests. So the tests are written in Python, but you can write—I mean, you can write them in many different uh, languages. So let's see. So the test should tell the server to open a new browser. So you see it opened automatically in the browser. You can see it being driven by the testing suite. It's okay. Okay, so it's sending these commands, and here it's doing exactly what it's told. So right now it's for example it's testing the create username. So you see it created Mike and Chris. So this was made by, I think, Mike Hansen and Mitesh Patel? Yeah, and maybe, t I think Tim Double also Tim did a push. Right, so th th this, was, this was great. Uh, that's what <coughs> I ran a few times after doing the flash tree write, and it found all sorts of bugs, and I fixed them. And it's, uh, I, I tried first to do it by hand, click at every button, and of course I missed something, because <laughs> there's a lot of chain, you know. And then I ran this, and I found sorts of other problems. And they were all small little iPhones. And stuff, but, right, so, so you see the... It's creating a worksheet, it's evaluating something, testing if it's working. So it's great, it's already there. Uh, it's in a folder called testing. So if you do any development, you want to test for the functionality of the notebook, make sure you run this. So right now, the only thing that would break right now is JMOL, because that's, that's not helpful. Okay, so we got OK, and then killed Firefox and so on. So there's like, um, 20, 30 tests. Uh, if you want to see. And you can write your own test. You get a Firefox extension. Uh, it only, it's only for Firefox, Firefox add on, I guess. Uh, <coughs> then you click record, click around, it records everything you've done, add some insert, uh, assertions, and then you can export it as a Python file <coughs> or as a, you know, whatever language you're using. And uh, then you can run it later, and then uh, you, can, you can hook it up to your unit test suite or whatever. All right, so that's the that's, that's the Selenium function function testing. So the problem with this web apps is that you want a different type of testing for stress testing. Because when you're doing functional testing, you open a whole browser. It's, it's a very slow procedure. You cannot simulate thousands of people hitting your server. So you need a different type of uh, approach for that, <coughs> different software. Something that does not actually go in the browser like Selenium. You want something that just sends the URL queries and uh, the GET requests and doesn't, doesn't keep state, doesn't simulate JavaScript. So it's all good for functional testing because you might have some JavaScript or something that changes your web page on the fly. And you cannot test that, but if you want to test the stress, the server. So we we didn't have we don't have any preferred way. I've been playing with something called Grinder, and uh, Jason Grout has something called Sung, which I never tested. He'll come tomorrow, and he'll probably tell us more about that. 
And I've been using the URL that... <coughs> and, yeah, and, uh, William just writes his own, because that's, that's how he prefers to do it. Uh, he just uh, writes, so you can just write your own stress test using Python URL lib and your own queries. So it says this is supposed to be very something that you do very fast and uh, you want stress test. So maybe I can demo Grinder. So, a little aside, but I don't know if, if you guys got the email yesterday. William and I made a, a little a single cell evaluation thing yesterday, which, uh, which uh, evaluates one line. No, not one line. It evaluates one block of uh, Python. So, whatever you want to give it. So, if you. Maybe you do something that takes longer so you can see the bar. Yeah, oh, that's right. It, 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 it uses Ajax. <laughs> uh, so. You probably need to do like time dot sleep. For it to really, well, maybe it's like into the 30. I don't think so. That's never going to finish. 10 to the 30. <laughs> That's not, it's just going to crash. Maybe 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, not 10 to the 30. No, they'll go in a second. Yeah, but 10 to the 30 will take a lot longer than a second. Yes, yay range. Doesn't even fit in memory. Thanks for watching. Oh, yeah, so there's a block. It's going to take forever. It'll, it, it times out after 5 seconds. Okay, that's, that's good. All right. Yeah, so you can see the part. Okay. Anyway, so uh, so this is something that we made so we can stress test because okay, so the problem with the current notebook, because I didn't mention that is it doesn't scale very well. So the server, the SageMat server, uh, when too many people get on it, it starts to slow down, and it's, it's more of a design problem because the load doesn't seem so high. Server itself at that time. So, before we start redesigning, so the, the Flask thing is already there. There's this huge redesign for the model that has to be done that might be even harder than the Flask because, you know, uh, the, maybe the, the new idea is so we were brainstorming during the last stage days, and, you know, one, one thing that seemed to emerge is a as a, as a way to go, that is to put a database to store all your models, and uh, that rewrite will be a little bit bigger because there's also a question which database to support Mongo or SQL and so on. So, so we, we made this safe <coughs> for the purpose of uh, stress testing. So, as we build something, we can keep. Have, have in mind scalability because it's, it's, it's something uh, none of us are web, web developers uh, by, by trade so it's hard to keep in mind what can what would you know when, when where are you adding things that eventually down the road will make it us not scalable so this is something that we can test against so uh, I set up this grinder thing so Grinder is a stress testing tool to test. So it's in, written in Java. So again, I, I just started playing with it a few months ago. It uses Swing, so it's very ugly. <laughs> so it has a console, it has an agent. So the agent is uh, the agent connects to a console. So we have many testing stress testing uh, agents. And they're all are multi-threaded, so it can really grind. <laughs> I, I, that's called Lambda. Okay, so what it's doing now is okay. So now it's wow. which one is it testing against? It's testing against Al Al Locally or no, the the one that you put. What? It, how's it so fast? We were doing it yesterday, it was like huh? four or five per second. Is it just sending or is it, is it sending and receiving? 
Oh, yeah. it's not Aleph, it's Aleph locally. No, no, it's, it's Aleph on your, on SageMap. Whoa, that's weird. The network must have been just really it was, slow well, I was testing the coffee shop earlier, and yeah. it was much slower, Rob saw that. It was like five. Yeah. So now it's a hundred. Wow. So well, when you, just when you run it locally, that's what you get. So uh, when you run it locally, or if you test directly on box and two box, and that's what you get. Uh -huh. So with no network, with very little network issues, that's what you should get. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. So the network just happens to be really fast. Yeah. I'm assuming they're correct. Yeah. yeah. So it's doing it's sending that multiplication over to box and putting it in a database, and another process is grabbing it out of the database, doing the calculation, getting the result, putting it back in the database, and then the web browser is getting it, or I guess Grinder is getting it, and that entire process is happening over 100 times a second. Pretty cool. Right. So yeah, that's. Uh, I guess I forgot to mention the technology behind. So the notebook, should, the Sage notebook, should be like that too. This yeah. network is showing pains of about 11 milliseconds. It's really, really good. Yeah, so and that is like so on the order of 10 or 11 milliseconds. Pass. Yeah. Spring break. <laughs> 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 Students are gone. Nobody forgot to queue up their torrents. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's a. Uh, Actually, somebody made this during the last Sage days. Uh, this is how we envision the new the new rewrite to work, and uh, this is how the Aleph right now works. Oh, it's too big. Enough. Okay. So this is how uh, we want to we want to structure the computation. So you want to have the client talk to the Flask, right? The web app. That's that's already there. So from there on, we have to do new. We have to do rewrite. We want all the all the action to happen in the database. So everything goes to the database. Now, if you want to, so the database, you know, we will do all the web app part things without. It does, doesn't need anything else. So that's how a regular web app stops here. Uh, web app like. Sage, which needs to have some execution. We have these devices, which would read into a database and see cells which say, I need to be computed, I need to be executed. So a device will go there, query those, pick up those, and then send them to the workers. And then it, the, the device can have itself many workers. So uh, the user does, cannot really talk to the workers. And so we're hoping by doing these databases, you know, the modern databases are very complicated piece of software. So they, they've thought about problems of concurrency and scalability and so on. So this way, this way it would relieve the, you know, it will be, it'll make the web the notebook much more scalable. And uh, so the way Aleph right now it's written, so it's based on uh, again something that started at stage is twenty seven. So right now, the, when it sends something, it goes into a database. Uh, we use Mongo right now. Yep. Yeah, so it's right now, the, it's, sent, it's put in Mongo, and then there's a device which goes and picks up uh, you know, everything it, it sees that's not evaluated, starts evaluating one another, then puts it back in a database. And then at that time, the Flask client queries. So the Flask client, the whole time, at every certain period, queries. Actually, right now, queries as fast as it can, just to stress test it. It just keeps on asking, is it ready yet? And then when it's, or the device puts it back in the database, the database sends it back to the, uh, to the Flask query, says so it's, it's ready. Otherwise, OK, yeah. So two different users ask for the same calculation with the server notice that they were the same? Uh, well, right now, it's not retired. Are you talking be. about in which context? Because uh, if, if, if two different people type two plus two, will it? In the Alice, in the one single cell evaluation thing, yeah. or in no, but that the database does store every input and mm -hmm. the corresponding output, so it could look up to see whether something's mm -hmm. been done. That's not implemented at present. It's only about three. I think the entire thing is maybe three pages of code. So, <laughs> so and we wrote it. We wrote the first version in forty-five minutes, and then we did some more yesterday to deploy it and make it a little prettier. But it's really not a, a very complicated piece of code. Um, for the notebook itself, of course, that doesn't make sense because you have the state. Yeah. But yeah, that, that's a nice optimization. Because if you have a class, for example, and they're all 
competing integrals or something. The first one, I mean, there, there's a big chance there's going to be an overlap about what they compute. And then, Especially if you've tested it first. So you exactly. Then they will get the right out. They'll get the output immediately, whatever it is. Yeah. Certain things will just be fast. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to just store that all in a database. It's um, the the execution of the block is done in a clean uh, namespace each time. Uh, there, there were problems with random. It's one single so it's one single block of code. It's evaluated from an absolutely clean namespace each time. So there's no. So I mean, no state. There's no state. The state is the default startup of Sage state. By definition, what? Yeah, dramatically different. It's just a single cell. It's like it's more like Wolfram Alpha. That's why it's <laughs> Alpha. <laughs> right? You're just, or it's more like before Wolfram Alpha, there's something called the online magma calculator or the online Perry calculator that I wrote in maybe 2001, and it's exactly like that, where you have a single cell, put some code in, you could output. You could, if you type online magma calculator, you can see the current version of that. And I read the first version of that in 2001. So it's a lot like that. I mean, it's actually really useful. Um, it's not the Sage Notebook, because you, you can't do thing after thing after thing. But if you just have one block of code, and you want to mess with it, and keep reevaluating it, then it works fine. It's just, but yeah, it's I, useful if you have a, you know, iPhone or a yeah. any smartphone. You, it's, you know, you do very quick calculation. Yeah, it's really simple. I'm mainly doing it as a simple thing that we can benchmark and understand what's going on. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. I mean, you see, if you're seeing 100, 100 complete calculations per second with this, and when you use the Sage Notebook, we get like, you know, one calculation per second, then we can say, hey, we should be able to do better. So that, that's the main motivation for me. <laughs> well, there's certain, I can, I mean, I post on the list many ways to crash all of them, so. I think, I don't know. I thought range 1, 10 to the power 7 or something. What it should do is uh, time yours out after a certain amount of yeah, time. Yeah, but I, I, I did a calculation which was quite fast, namely range 10 to the 7, but actually transmitting all the data takes very, very long. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, that would okay. cause trouble. Yeah, yeah it's, it's broken. <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't, it's, it's, I mean, it was I don't know, I, I posted it on the list that wasn't meant for, this wasn't meant for stress testing, stuff like that, because it has no safeguards against anything like that. And in fact, the device workers, if you look at this picture, there's several different devices that look, do something. Um, I just ran one single device process, and it's just one single process that does everything. It just looks in the database, gets stuff, and then gets it back, since it was mainly for benchmarking. And of course, that would, if you, if you cause that one thing to do a lot of work, then it would just sit there forever. Yeah, I mean it's it's for it's it's a toy thing for now. Well, thank you for breaking it. Are we start the device worker? Yeah, it's uh, right, because also it's the first time we use database and other devices, so we're just testing the new, the new design. One neat thing is the. Um, so the way it's deployed, Aleph is actually gone. It's using Apache and Mod WSGI. So it's just like Apache. It's using a system-wide Python and Mod WSGI. Um, and the actual work that was done using the Sage NBWS uh, account. <coughs> so there's sort of different things happening there. And then the database is running as WSTein. So there's like three or four different users involved in this, which is kind of neat. All right, so yeah, so this is the short-term goals. There's a annoying bug currently. In the notebook. Document too large. Bison. Ah. <laughs> That's when it tried to save the answer into the database that it ran into trouble because it doesn't catch trying to insert a document beyond four megabytes in the database. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually kind of neat. So that's why it stopped. All right. So okay. it should work again if you. Oh no no wait. Oh crap. It keeps trying to do the same calculation and put it in the database and failing. <laughs> yep. All right. So the current tasks. Yes. There, there's a there's a bug 
that some people complain about disappearing. This, there's some kind of desynchronization that happens once in a while, especially on slow networks, and uh, some people experience losing text. So somebody, there, there's a pretty good uh, post on the Sage Notebook, somebody who actually has the, you know, it, 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 there's a, it's a reproducible bug, according to the post. So that's something that needs to be fixed. So the other thing is to finalize this Flask version and hopefully more people testing it. Okay, so, uh, and of course, understand the scalability issues and this is, say, Chalef was made for that to understand, you know, this is, are we, you know, are we on the right track? Is this the right way to do this? And should we go on and build a notebook from there using this database and these devices? Okay, then the load. So, can you try to break it again? Yeah. Idea here. Can you try again? Um, this is yeah. sort of a test bed for ideas for something that will eventually replace what is the notebook today. Right. But but it's also it's also used, you know, it's also function, you know. Yeah, it's got its functions. It has its own function, so yeah. So maybe we wouldn't grow out of it into a new notebook, but uh, more like keep this as a national innovation. Because some people actually, I like this. I know the magma thing is used by lots of people. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's a little throwaway computation. So yeah. Nice yeah. You don't need to, you know, you don't need to log in. Uh, so. All right. And uh, right. So then, long-term goals. Also, um, Dan Drake said it would be useful for Sage Tech because. He can make Sage Tech send the entire, all everything it needs to get computed to this thing. So this thing yeah. It gets computed and it, get, and it gets it back. And it has a really, really simple um, HTTP scheme where you just say, like, there's some URLs that you can go to to do everything. Yeah. Yep. So you can run Sage Tech without Sage. Exactly. Yeah. And it would, I think it would be really good for a standalone iPhone app as well, um, where you would use this particular server in the back end. And there's no, you don't have to worry about authentication, logins. I, I mean, it just runs. Really, really simple from the point of view of programming against it. Um, OS 10 developer guy, you. Have you ever written an iPhone app? It's really, I mean, it's Xcode. So. Who paid a hundred dollars? To be to be a developer, you need to pay hundred dollars. Yeah. I would have no difficulty if you had an iPhone app. I could pay the hundred dollars to post it on the store from the All Sage right, Foundation. So the goals, let's see. Um, yeah. So then also future features, I would like to see some things that I, I like to see for the notebook. Uh, I was, you know, it would be nice to have more widgets, like this matrix things, it would be nice to somehow get integrated. Uh, and other things, any, any mathematical object can ideally have a, some kind of web widget, which keeps its Sage data. You can see it, interact with it, send it back to Sage, and so on which would make it easier for the user. Uh, something is, there's been a lot of talk about folders and labels, so uh, I don't know if anything is done. I think William had something about folders. But the, I mean, it might, if, if there's going to be a big rewrite on the database, it might be too late. So these are long-term ideas. Uh, it can, the notebook can be made prettier, I think. So I think it needs some, if anybody is a, Graphics designer or knows a graphics designer, I think they should. I mean, the templates are there. You can just take the templates. Uh, templates are the least likely thing to change in the next iteration. So yeah. the best thing would be the themeability also. The, the, right now, it supports custom CSS. Yeah, but there are, But it should be like Firefox, where there's you know a library of fifty themes you can choose from and stuff. Right. And examples and all that. Yeah. I tried to push that, but nobody really did it. Yeah, that, that's something that should be. I mean, because right now it's that if you look, there's three types of, or four types of buttons, and they all look different. And they're all just buttons in a way, like yeah. save and this and then print. I don't know what print looks like this. Because I copied Google Docs. <laughs> yeah. it's really, they're very it's old. Very, it's very consistent. I mean, it can. Yeah. It, it would. You know, it's the first thing people see. Usually. So that's something that would be nice. It works on, and I think it has great potential for class communications for those of us who are in academia. Uh, 
if you can, you know, maybe an extension, maybe not on top of this notebook, but have something like a submit button where when students are working on a homework, they, they don't just share it, they submit it to a grader, and then the grader can grade it and send it back. And, uh, that, that, that's something that I think all the universities are moving towards to, because they all want to integrate, uh, they want to integrate some kind of web app, and they, all, they use Blackboard and Moodle, and I've used, I've used Blackboard, not so much Moodle, but they both don't look, they look very heavy and I say, I think uh, something built on top of Sage would, be, would, make, would make a great idea. And, uh, it, it, it's, you know, the students can be working within their notebook and then whenever they're ready, they can just submit it to the grader and then get it back. All right, so, yeah, <coughs> why am I excited about the notebook? And you should be too. First of all, remote execution does not work well with restrictive licensing. So this is a unique, notebook is a, I, I view it as a very unique thing to Sage that uh, the other big, the other big uh, software, the other big uh, computer algebra systems, yeah, they don't have anything as featured, fully featured as the notebook. And uh, it, it just doesn't make sense when you, if, if you run, you know, if, if I run my own Mathematica and let somebody else compute on my machine, then they don't need to pay for it. So, and so it doesn't make sense for them, but for Sage it does make sense. So it's, it's a great opportunity to set the standard in a way and move forward. Right, the web technologies, like I showed, I showed you so many, so many things, they're just out there, they just need to be grabbed. Even, even this Sage Aleph thing, uh, yesterday when we were making it, to make a tab indentation, it's it's not a, tr a text area does not have if you hit tab it will just move out of the text area. One well, Google search there's a jQuery extension for it. You plug it in, it works. It's, it's as simple as that. There's so much stuff out there for the web. So when you're developing for the web, it's it's moving very fast. Things are out there. Just gotta get them um, right. So I think also it's a great opportunity to make some kind of class communication web app on top of the notebook. And uh, the last thing, uh, Windows users, right, they feel neglected. But uh, the note, if, if there's a robust notebook, they wouldn't notice any difference because the browsers, you know, the, the notebook by default is OS independent, right? Because we, we, that problem about OS compatibility is given to the browser makers. They have been, uh, I guess, all right job, <laughs> good job. So, you know, uh, if a Windows users go to a notebook and the notebook is really good, then they're, they're using Sage, then they don't. I mean, most users don't care where the actual execution happens. In fact, it'll be better because the users are usually using netbooks and the computer on which this is running will be faster than a netbook. Right, right. So, I mean, we, we have the Sage Mat server, and it's, right now it's, it's not utilized because, because the notebook is not. It, it's rewrite. Thousands of users uh, running computations on your server, though. How much, uh, how much stress can it take in terms of complex and fast forward queries? I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that. If we go ahead with this plan, that might, uh, you know, then you can have Amazon S3 workers, or you know, you can, you can yeah. spawn, you can I mean, spawn you, workers. At, if know. you literally have thousands of people at once, enough that it's overloading the resources we have now, then you have a way to get more resources, because you can put a few ads up. You can probably easily get a grant if it's mainly educational people. Uh, I certainly have the money to buy more resources if I had a use for it for this sort of thing. But yeah, if you have if you have thousands, of, I think if you have like a thousand things being computed at once, so you really need way. I, have, I mean, I have well over a hundred cores just in my stuff in the math department. So if if we're really using a lot more than that, that would mean probably ten thousand users at once, because people aren't all hammering it identically, you know. And if you have ten thousand people hitting your site all day long, um, you have a revenue.
revenue stream, <laughs> basically. And you can, I mean, already people often approach me about um, paying to have a Sage Notebook service for their particular university or class hosted. And so, um, and the main, I mean, that would only increase if there are this many users. So, I think it's a problem that could easily and very pleasantly take care of itself, actually. Yeah, and I mean, the scales, like I think right now the execution is slowing down the server. Like the, yeah. it, the, the scale that, the number of people that are hitting the Sage server is not something that should really slow down the server. But the problem is because we have all this, I mean, if it was just a web app server, which didn't have Sage execution in the background. But uh, because for those things you can get millions of people. The, the, the problem is right now there is no such device separation. <coughs> okay, well, yeah, that's so. I had to uh, have any questions. Any other questions? So the presentation would be nice where you have slides with I actually agree because <laughs> this was not very pleasant. <laughs> And again, there, there's HTML presentation. You know, there's JavaScript presentation libraries which take your, you know, take HTML and make uh, slides out of it. And the question is, take those and cook them up to the public. There's also Beamer with SageTag. It solves a different problem because then you're not doing a presentation in the notebook anymore. Right. Notebook is not presentation. Um, the problem there is actually a presentation the notebook mode in there. And the presentation gets broken every time something changes. Oh, no, you could try it. Why don't you try it? Rather, there is a presentation mode. If you go up to action one cell mode, there is a presentation mode. Uh, and toggle. Click toggle. And action one cell mode. It only allows you to do one cell at a time. And then you see you have something at the top which I flip through. But it, all the text. So it was implemented before there was text. So if it's all compute cells, then it works fine. But if there's text, it doesn't flip through them, which is the problem. So it's like displaying exactly one of the compute cells at a time. Okay. But it doesn't do the text cells. Right? So yeah, because it was implemented years before the text cells were ever put there. There's also a patch on track I made for a, a slideshow mode that works with like this. And I think you put a horizontal rule in or something, and that's what separates the slides. And um, it was pretty good, but it wasn't absolutely perfect, so I didn't get it, and I didn't have time to fix it. Um, probably wouldn't be hard to rebase, actually, because I don't think it's, yeah, I think it would be possible to rebase, maybe. I think scalability is a higher priority. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so let's think about it.